We'd like people to remember that Sherry was 23 years old the day she went to work at UCLA for the last time, um, that she was a young girl living her life to the fullest. She really, really wanted to make a difference in the world. She really wanted to change it. Shehar Bano Sanji, Sherry to her friends, was employed as a laboratory research assistant at the University of California, Los Angeles. She had just received her bachelor's degree in chemistry and was applying to law schools. On December 29, 2008, Ms. Sanji was transferring a highly reactive chemical when some of it sprayed onto her hands and synthetic sweater and spontaneously ignited. Sherry's older sister, Naveen Sanji, now a surgical resident at Harvard, recalls the day of the accident. When my phone rang unexpectedly um, and I saw that Sherry was calling me, I thought she was calling to tell me about another law school that she'd heard from. And um, it turned out to be a social worker from the UCLA Medical Center who told me what happened and I was in shock. She had deep third degree burns to over 40% of her body. Sherry Sanji died from her injuries 18 days after the laboratory accident. There was a life ahead that she was really looking forward to that was cut short by what happened to her at UCLA. Accidents in research laboratories are not isolated events. Since 2001, the CSB has gathered preliminary information on 120 explosions, fires, and chemical releases at university laboratories and other research facilities around the country. The accidents have caused deaths, serious injuries, and extensive property damage. This CSB video reports on three laboratory accidents. The 2008 fatality at UCLA, a death by accidental poisoning of a highly regarded Dartmouth College professor in 1997, and a 2010 explosion at Texas Tech University, or TTU, that severely injured a graduate student. It would be a shame if not every university stopped what it was doing whenever a major accident happens, like at TTU, like at UCLA, and take it as an opportunity to examine their own safety practices to determine what similarities there are. The CSB investigated the Texas Tech accident producing a case study that the board believes includes important safety lessons for academia as a whole. The CSB is concerned with laboratory safety because it's an area that appears, um, in comparison to industry, um, pretty unregulated. There is an OSHA laboratory standard, but its focus is on exposure hazards and health hazards of the research work being conducted. University research is a large and highly competitive enterprise. The CSB estimates there are over 110,000 graduate students and postdoctoral researchers working in academic laboratories across the U.S. Government agencies and private organizations spend billions of dollars sponsoring research at university labs. Academic institutions, principal investigators, and lab workers face significant pressures to innovate, achieve, and gain funding and recognition for their work. Research conducted at university laboratories is often on the forefront of technology and innovation. It is important that this research continues and thrives, but it must be done within a strong safety culture where preventing hazards is an important value. On December 29, 2008, when most of the campus was closed for holiday vacation, Sherry Sanji was working on a research project at the UCLA Chemistry Department. According to a report by California State OSHA, Ms. Sanji was using a syringe to transfer a solution of tertiary butyl lithium, a dangerous pyrophoric chemical that ignites spontaneously on contact with air. Somehow, the plunger came out of the syringe barrel the chemical was exposed to air, it caught on fire. She also had an open flask of a flammable solvent in the hood where she was working. She knocked that over, that caught fire as well. Chemist Dr. Jillian Kemsley reported extensively about the UCLA accident for Chemical and Engineering News 
using documents obtained under California open records laws. My reaction to the news of uh, Sherry's death was just shock. Um, and I think pretty much the entire chemistry community was shocked. California OSHA cited UCLA's chemistry department for failing to require appropriate body protection for laboratory workers handling pyrophoric materials. An internal UCLA safety inspection of the same laboratory just two months prior to the accident found that personal protective equipment was not fully utilized by laboratory personnel. Yet on the day of the accident, Ms. Sanji had neither a flame-resistant lab coat nor the much more extensive protective clothing recommended by manufacturers of pyrophoric chemicals. Dr. Kemsley believes that even a flame-resistant lab coat would have helped. The flame-resistant lab coat would have given more time to react. It would have slowed the progress of the fire um, and probably would have meant that her injuries were less severe. And though the university said it provided adequate safety training for workers, California OSHA found no documented evidence of this. This accident has affected the campus in a profound way, uh, from, from my office to the PIs to the chancellor and the upper administration. And we all recognized that we had to make some um, changes to our program to further strengthen it. Dr. James Gibson, director of UCLA's Environment, Health, and Safety Office, says UCLA has taken steps to improve safety accountability and oversight improve training, provide proper protective equipment, conduct unannounced safety inspections, and improve laboratory safety culture. It's not going to happen overnight. That is something that's going to be a multiple year process to really change the safety culture to where we think we should be. And Dr. Gibson urges other universities to take steps to improve their education, training, and safety culture. Once we get people to do that, we're going to see a dramatic decrease in the number of accidents that occur. One of our main aims is to try and make sure that this doesn't happen again and that no one has to go through what we went through. A lost life is not just an anonymous loss of life, but real people and families are profoundly affected. Safety has to be an absolute priority and the first priority for any laboratory. In August 1996, acclaimed professor Karen Wetterhahn was conducting research on the biological impacts of heavy metals in her lab at Dartmouth College. She was working with small amounts of a highly toxic compound called dimethylmercury. She used a mechanical pipetting device to transfer the liquid compound while wearing latex rubber gloves. During this process, she later told colleagues, one or two drops landed on her gloved left hand. Dr. John Wynn is a professor of chemistry at Dartmouth College, where he has worked for almost 30 years. At the time of Karen Wetterhahn's accident, he was chair of the chemistry department. She was not aware that she was in any peril at the time. She cleaned up the accident, disposed of her gloves properly. Everything had been carried out in a uh, appropriate fume hood in her laboratory, and that was that. The, the spill was not considered by her significant enough to report. She was in no danger as far as she knew. At the time, Professor Wynne said, no one in the department knew that dimethylmercury could seep through the latex rubber gloves worn by Professor Wetteron. But five months later, in January 1997, she began to show serious neurologic symptoms as her balance, gait, and speech deteriorated rapidly. Despite medical treatment for heavy metal poisoning, three weeks later, she became unresponsive and died in June 1997, 10 months after the accident. I think we were all stunned, not only that it was Karen, a very careful and, and capable researcher, but to find that such a seemingly innocuous event could have led to what ultimately was Karen's death was just Un unimaginably shocking. According to Dartmouth officials, Professor Wetterhahn had consulted the material safety data sheet for dimethylmercury, which advised the use of latex rubber gloves when handling the material. 
Professor Wynn says the tragedy led the university to emphasize the need for comprehensive hazard evaluations, rather than relying exclusively on the safety precautions from chemical suppliers. There was an increase in that sort of uh, safety instruction in the sense that it expanded into things that we had not realized required such care and detail, mm -hmm. such as glove material. The fact that she was doing something any of us would have done in terms of the care she took to transfer this small amount of material was, for all of us, the wake-up call, the signal event that says, whenever confronted with a material known to be toxic at whatever level, whether super toxic as this one was or not, we must be diligent, learn all we can from as many experts as we can about the nature of the hazard and about the protections that can be taken to handle it safely. In January 2010, two graduate students at Texas Tech University were conducting research on energetic or explosive compounds, funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The students were tasked with synthesizing and performing tests on a new compound, a derivative of nickel hydrazine perchlorate. Initially, the compound was made in small batches of less than 300 milligrams. But the two students were concerned about potential variability among different small batches of the compound, which could affect later test results. So they decided to scale up the synthesis to make a single batch of approximately 10 grams, enough for all of their testing. They believed that keeping the solid compound wet with the solvent would keep it from exploding. After producing the larger batch, the more senior graduate student observed that it contained clumps that he believed needed to be broken up prior to testing. While wearing safety goggles, he transferred half of the new compound into a mortar, covered the compound with a solvent, and used a pestle to gently break up the clumps. After some time, he took his goggles off and walked away. A short time later, he decided to stir the compound once again. He did not replace his goggles. As the pestle pressed against the compound, it detonated. The graduate student was seriously injured, his left hand severely damaged by the force of the explosion, causing the loss of three fingers, perforation of his eye, and cuts and burns to other parts of his body. Post-accident photos and video show extensive damage as the explosion fractured the lab bench, shattered bottles, and sprayed the lab with projectiles. Professor Dominic Casadante was head of the Texas Tech Chemistry Department at the time of the accident. From my perspective as department chair, you go through the emotional trauma of, oh my gosh, somebody that I know has gotten very seriously hurt to soul searching, why did this happen? With these academic incidents, people like to focus on the immediate actions of the individual involved and try to poke holes and, and, and with hindsight, you know, assert some sort of blame on the incident on the individual involved. And what we have to recognize is that there are bigger uh, systems at play here that can influence safety. The CSB investigation at Texas Tech found deficiencies in each layer of safety management within the institution. These included insufficient safety accountability and oversight by the principal investigators, the chemistry department, and the university's administration. And according to investigators, there were also important gaps beyond the university itself. I think that the way we were a year and a half ago is pretty representative of the way that a lot of universities, especially chemistry departments, are around the country. The main lesson I would really like, and it's the way that I start a lot of my talks on safety, is there but for the grace of God go you, that is to say your universities. The victim at Texas Tech had been working on the energetic materials project for about a year at the time of the accident. But the CSB found that he did not receive any specific formal training on working with potentially explosive compounds. The two principal investigators believed they had verbally established a 100 milligram limit on the production of energetic materials. But the CSB investigation found there was no formal system for communicating this limit or verifying compliance. 
None of the lab researchers believed that a strict 100 milligram limit existed. When graduate students go into these new endeavors, a new project, um, a new process, they need to get specific training and they need to have it insured and have it assessed so they really understand what it is they're doing. And the CSB found that the use of personal protective equipment within Texas Tech laboratories was not consistently enforced. When we were at TTU, we learned that many people made the decision whether or not to wear their personal protective equipment based on the level of danger they felt that they were about to undertake. One of the issues that the CSB examined with the TTU incident was safety accountability. How do universities and academic institutions ensure that people are working in a safe environment? What we found at TTU was that the organizational structure was such that individuals that were responsible for doing safety inspections did not have direct authority or oversight over the principal investigators and their laboratories. Prior to the accident, the, uh, the whole safety management structure reported to the Vice President for Administration and Finance um, after this accident, uh, the Provost and the President and I looked at this very carefully and decided that a new reporting structure was required. Dr. Taylor Amy is the Vice President for Research at Texas Tech University. Since the accident, Texas Tech has modified its organizational structure so that the Environmental Health and Safety Director reports to Dr. Amy, who also has authority over the principal investigators. We did this because we wanted to have uh, this safety culture, this changing safety culture, to have a chance to, to grow and, and, and become part of the fabric of the institution. We, we needed to connect it more closely to the academic life of faculty. The CSB investigation determined there had been two previous near misses within the laboratories of the same principal investigators since 2007. While no one was injured, CSB investigators concluded there were similarities in the causes of these incidents to the January 2010 explosion. But these key lessons were missed at the time of the earlier incidents. The CSB would like to see TTU and really all universities create a tracking system to document the accidents that are happening so that they can facilitate learning, not just in the laboratory where the accident happened, but really in all laboratories. One of the areas that the CSB examined with the TTU case was the role of the grant funding agency uh, in regard to safety. The CSB determined that the Department of Homeland Security, which funded the research at Texas Tech through an agreement with Northeastern University, had a general condition stating that the safety of researchers was the responsibility of the various host institutions. However, DHS did not impose any specific safety requirements for research with energetic materials, and Texas Tech did not evaluate the hazards or develop any specific university safety policies. Grant funding bodies can play a huge role in influencing safety by including stipulations and requirements in their grant applications. Because Texas Tech is a public institution in a state that lacks its own workplace safety program, it is not required to abide by the federal OSHA laboratory safety standard. But Texas Tech officials did voluntarily develop a chemical hygiene plan, using the OSHA laboratory standard as guidance. When you look at OSHA's laboratory standard, though, it also focuses on health hazards of chemicals, not physical hazards of chemicals. That almost can lead one to decide that it precludes the need for writing standard operating procedures when working with chemicals that provide um, large physical hazards, fires, explosions, etc. To highlight this gap in the laboratory standard, the CSB recommended that OSHA issue a safety bulletin on the importance of controlling physical hazards of chemicals in the laboratory. And the CSB noted that no comprehensive guidance exists for conducting hazard evaluations within the dynamic environment of academic research laboratories. There's a lot of good suggestions and kind of hints at how to do it, but there's not a comprehensive guidance on how to conduct thorough hazard evaluations for these graduate students who are doing much more independent research work. As a result, the Chemical Safety Board recommended that the American Chemical Society develop a methodology for evaluating and controlling hazards in academic research laboratories. The board also recommended that Texas Tech University should revise and expand its chemical hygiene plan 
to ensure that the physical hazards of chemicals are controlled and develop and implement an incident and near-miss reporting system. There's a lot of momentum here for um, safety consciousness on campus, but it shouldn't have had to come to that. Don't wait for a serious accident to happen on your campus to begin to think about safety and transform your own culture. When we think about the role of principal investigators and senior campus administrators in lab safety programs, I have concerns because in many places, I feel they are not providing the leadership in this that's needed. Dr. James Kaufman is the president of the Laboratory Safety Institute a nonprofit organization which provides safety training for universities. Academic institutions encourage their students to achieve excellence in their work. They need to apply that same high standard to their laboratory safety programs, environmental health and safety programs. To achieve a high safety standard, the CSB investigation identified key laboratory safety lessons for universities. Ensure that research-specific hazards are evaluated and then controlled by developing specific written protocols and training. Expand existing laboratory safety plans to address the physical hazards of chemicals. Ensure that safety personnel report directly to a university official who has the authority to oversee research laboratories and implement safety improvements. Document and communicate all laboratory near misses and incidents. You know, I, I have a PhD in physical chemistry and I have a lab safety story. I could pull together many friends and we could sit in a room and share our lab safety stories. That should make us stop and ask these stories that we can share, those of us who've gone through the graduate program, you know, are those just stories or are those really opportunities to ensure that nobody dies again or nobody is seriously injured again, at least to the best of our abilities? Exploring the unknown, doing research, always involves risks. Those risks are worth taking. We know that as a society. And as a society, we owe it to ourselves to do them in the most efficacious and safe ways we can. The CSB calls on universities to study the key lessons from our Texas Tech accident investigation and do everything possible to provide safe working environments in their laboratories. Thank you for watching the CSB safety video. To obtain the CSB's case study on the Texas Tech University laboratory accident, please visit csb.gov.